Okay, well, it looks like just about everybody is here. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome and thank you everyone for joining us this morning for Coffee with the Collection. My name is Amanda. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. Before we get started, let's go over a little housekeeping first. Everyone should be on mute right now, and I'd like to ask you all to keep yourselves muted so we can hear our presenter without any distractions. But if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to do so using the chat feature. To open your chat, scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on the icon that looks like a speech bubble. It should also say chat just underneath. Once you click that, a window will open to the side of your screen where you'll be able to type questions and comments and we'll circle back around to those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Without any further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Karen Bowles, who will be discussing Duncan Grant's painting, Portrait of Vanessa Bell from the museum's permanent collection. Karen serves as community learning coordinator here at the FRED. She has been on the museum staff for over 15 years now and oversees many of our ongoing school and family programs for some of our youngest visitors. Today as a treat, we're letting her talk to grownups. <laughs> Karen earned a bachelor's degree in English literature from Oklahoma Baptist University and a master's degree in art history from OU, where she researched Vanessa Bell and the other Bloomsbury group artists for her thesis. She lives in Norman with her husband, a new puppy, and lots of books, but daydreams about running away to London quite frequently. Karen, I may have to join you if you ever do that. <laughs> um, so I'd like to invite everyone to sit back, relax, grab your cup of coffee. Hopefully you have with you this month's special roast, one of many, made available especially for this program through our friends at Black Kimmel Coffee, and will continue to be available on their website after this program. Now, the first thing I'd like to do before I hand this over to Karen is to ask everyone a question that you can answer by typing into the chat window that I mentioned earlier. So my question for you all is, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Just kidding, <laughs> that's not really my question. <laughs> the real question is, what comes to mind when you think about the Bloomsbury Group? If anything comes to mind at all. Crickets. <laughs> Unconventional. That is from our coffee friends. Karen, I think that may be it. I'm going to let Maybe you. That think. means we don't know about the Bloomsbury Group. That's <laughs> all right, because we're going to learn a little bit about them today. All right, Hadley says E.M. Forster. Yes. Um, well, I was interested to know who might be familiar with the Bloomsbury Group and who is not. And if you're not, that's totally fine. Um, today, we are going to be focusing on Duncan Grant, who's one of the uh, visual artists associated with the group. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about the group in general. Um, I was actually introduced to them originally through the novelist E.M. Forster, who Hadley just mentioned in the chat. Uh, so some of you may be aware of his novels, Howard's End, A Room with a View. Um, there's some great Merchant Ivory films based on his work. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other members in just a minute. So Duncan Grant, who you see in the center of this slide, and then the two women who are in the portraits that you'll see on either side of that, that are part of our collection, they were all members of the famous or perhaps infamous or maybe for some of us not so familiar Bloomsbury group in England, um, which was an informer, informal collective of writers, artists, and thinkers that included, among others, novelist Virginia Woolf, um, Ian Forster, as I just mentioned, biographer Lytton Strachey, economist John Maynard Keynes, um, artist and critic Roger Fry, art critic Clive Bell, and artist Vanessa Bell, who we'll talk about more, who was Virginia Woolf's sister, and Duncan Grant, who's part of our collection. Um, this group was named after an area of London, central London, um, not far from the British Museum, where they first congregated. Uh, the group was once described as a circle of friends who lived in squares and loved in triangles. Uh, you can find actual flowcharts that show the complicated web of relationships uh, between the, the members of this group. So needless to say, with a really large cast of characters, we're going to only touch on some of them today as they relate to our featured artist, Duncan Grant. 
Um, so here again is Grant. This is a photo from when he was about 25 years old. Um, Grant was born in 1885 in the Highlands of Scotland, and he was an only child. Uh, his family spent a lot of time in India, but he was sent back to London at an early age to go to school, and he lived with his grandmother and then later with his aunt and uncle, the Strachys. Uh, this would be an important connection because while Grant ended up going to art school and studying in both London and Paris, his cousin Lytton went to Cambridge and his friends from university would become Duncan Grant's connection into the Bloomsbury world. So as I said, he studied in London and Paris. He became friends with Gertrude and Leo Stein while he was in Paris and later through them, artists like Matisse and Picasso, who we are probably very familiar with. Um, Grant was described as handsome, charming, funny, warm, curious, non-judgmental, non and he was youthful even into his old age. He was a favorite of many people um, in and outside the, the Bloomsbury group. Early on, Grant established the habit of, of painting almost every day that he could, and he lived to the age of 93. So you can imagine his output, his output was quite prolific, and he tried out many different styles. He collaborated with fellow artists on a wide variety of projects, and hopefully today we'll get to a taste of some of those. We'll see just a few uh, to be able to see how the works in our collection fit into that context. Uh, the two paintings that you saw just a minute ago, and we'll look at them more closely, um, are both from around 1912, and that fits into one of the most interesting decades for the Bloomsbury artists, 1910 to 1920. Uh, this is the period that Duncan Grant, along with Vanessa Bell and Roger Fry, the other two major art visual artists in the group, produced some of their most cutting edge work, and in fact, some of the most cutting edge work that was being done in England at that time. So um, just a little bit more about Bloomsbury in general. These are some photos from the area of Bloomsbury in London. On the left, you'll see a home that we'll talk about a little bit more in just a second um, in Gordon Square. And then on the right is Tavistock Square. These are all pretty close together. And this is the area of London where the group first formed. It is important to keep in mind, though, that it wasn't an official group. Um, they did not use the label themselves. There wasn't an official membership list, no manifestos, no official stances like you sometimes get uh, with other artistic groups um, in the early 20th century. They didn't have you know, official statements on political or artistic issues, but all that said, they did share some similarities and interests, including liberal politics, progressive views on social issues like women's rights, pacifism, atheism. Um, they emphasized friendship, achieving good through art and beauty, and the importance of aesthetic contemplation. Um, the core of the group was originally made up of the Stephen siblings. So Vanessa was the oldest, and then her brother Toby, and Virginia, later Virginia Woolf, and their younger brother Adrian. Um, the siblings all came from a prominent family, but they were on their own as early adults and teens after the deaths of their parents. And they threw off all of the expectations, kind of the prim and proper Edwardian um, guidelines that they'd grown up with. And in 1904, Vanessa took her siblings and moved them out of a really um, nice area, Hyde Park Gate, and to the then unfashionable middle-class Bloomsbury neighborhood that you're seeing here. Um, it's possible, actually, if anyone has read Ian e. Forster's Howard's End, it's been speculated that the siblings in that story were actually, at least in part, inspired by Vanessa and the other Stephen siblings. Um, so Toby was the oldest brother, the second oldest sibling, and he had gone to Cambridge. And when they moved out on their own to Gordon Square, he began hosting what they called at-homes um, on Thursday evenings for his friends. And it was just late nights of conversation, um, drinking, joking, um, completely outside the bounds of traditional propriety at the time, um, partly because it was men and women together socializing unmarried, unchaperoned. Um, shockingly, they addressed each other by first names, and um, they would talk about any topic. Nothing was off limits. Uh, it was a very accepting atmosphere, talking about politics, relationships, um, which was especially important to a number of members of the group who were homosexual, 
which it's important to note that in the time in that time in England, and in fact, into the late 1960s, homosexuality was still criminalized. So to have such an open um, group of friends was very important to them at the time. Um, later, not wanting to take a back seat with the visual arts, Vanessa Bell, who was a painter, claimed Fridays for meetings for her friends from art school instead of the university crowd. And that group sometimes put together exhibitions. Uh, it was through that Friday club group, the visual art group, that Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant first met in 1905. Um, they struck up a very close friendship and working relationship. Um, later added to that group was Roger Fry, who was the other major painter. And by around 1910, the three of them were doing a lot of work together um, collaborating on projects. We'll talk about some of those. And um, Roger Fry actually, along with Vanessa Bell's later husband, Clive, who was a, a writer and an art critic, they played a pivotal role along with Grant and Bell um, in promoting modern art in England at a time that they were a little bit behind as far as um, the styles that you would find in Europe. So I want to show you, um, keep in mind what this, this photograph on the left look like, looks like and these next two paintings um, actually show that home, the 46 Gordon Square. So these are two works by, on the left, Vanessa Bell, and on the right, Duncan Grant, uh, that were done just a few years apart, but I wanted to show you some examples of how their style started changing um, in this decade that we're talking about. So um, on the left is Vanessa Bell's work. It's starting to shift towards a little bit more modern style than what she probably studied at art school. Um, but this is one of her few early works that still survives. A lot of their um, works prior to 1910 or so were actually destroyed during World War II bombings in London, so there aren't as many examples. Um, Grant had studied with English painter Edward Byrne Jones, and Vanessa Bell studied at art school with actually John Singer Sargent. So if you're familiar with any of his work, you'll know kind of where they're coming from. Um, Roger Fry, who's slightly older, had actually spent most of his career as an art critic um, focusing on the Italian old masters. But after seeing works by Cezanne and becoming personally acquainted with artists like Picasso and Matisse in Paris, um, these artists all started beginning to experiment with more expressive styles, less realistic styles. Um, so these were painted, again, just a few years apart, and you can kind of see how they jump from mostly realistic to, on the right, Duncan Grant's painting from 1915, where he's reduced everything to just um, very bright colors and geometric shapes for the most part. He often worked um, on subjects more than once, and we'll see that in a little bit, and he also did a different version of the same painting that was a collage rather than an oil painting. Um, around this time, as they start experimenting more, and we'll see some of their, their more um, radical experiments here in a bit, but Grant's cousin actually commented to Clive Bell, Vanessa's husband, um, I love this quote, cannot you or Vanessa persuade Duncan to make beautiful pictures instead of these coagulations of distressing oddments? So obviously their experiments weren't completely accepted by even their own group. I um, wanted to show you this painting, which was done by Vanessa Bell, and it's actually of a part of an exhibition that the group put together in 1912. So Roger Fry and Clive Bell, who were art critics, um, organized two major exhibitions actually in 1910 and then later in 1912, the second um, second edition that brought large numbers of works by artists like Cezanne, Picasso, and Matisse to London for the very first time. Um, so again, Britain was maybe lagging a little bit behind as far as being familiar with some of these artists that were working at the time. And these exhibitions were at least the first time that um, people in England could see these artists in large numbers, works by these artists in large numbers. This painting um, actually shows a room in the, sex in the second exhibition that held, I believe, about 30 works by Henri Matisse, including, um, you might recognize over here on the side, his painting, The Red Studio, which is now in the Modern Museum of Art in New York. So this gave people in England a chance to see these works in a substantial number. Um, one interesting side note for the 1910 exhibition, Roger Fry actually coined a term that's thrown around 
all the time in art history, post-impressionist to describe painters like Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Cezanne, um, just kind of a convenient term to lump them together, the people that came after the Impressionists. Uh, this exhibition, the 1910 one, and then also the 1912, really made a huge impact on the art scene in England. Uh, Virginia Woolf noted, on or about December 1910, human character changed. So for her, even as a, an author, she saw a lot of things that opened up ideas, um, want, you know, encouraging writers and artists to be a little bit more experimental in their approaches. Um, the 1912 show that was kind of a follow-up, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant were both included in that show along with French and Russian artists. So it kind of brought Britain into the conversation. Um, not unlike the Armory show in New York in 1913, like I said, it had a really big impact, but not necessarily in a good way for the public. Uh, the English public was not necessarily prepared for seeing some of these, these contemporary works. Uh, the press called it an art quake. There were a lot of negative reviews, a lot of criticism of Roger Fry, who at that point was known, like I said, for dealing with classical Italian work. So this was not expected for him. And people came to the gallery. They, it was very popular as far in terms of attendance, but people came and got very upset. They shook their umbrellas angrily. Um, maybe this is why we still have rules about not bringing umbrellas into our galleries. I'm not sure. Um, but it at least opened up a conversation and um, brought some of these artists to England and then encouraged these English artists to do some experiments of their own. Roger Fry, um, Duncan Grant, and Vanessa Bell definitely did take on the challenge to experiment themselves. And I'll show you a few things um, that they were doing around this time. Um, on the left is one of my favorite paintings by Vanessa Bell called Studland Beach. And you can see she's taken still a realistic um, scene at this point, but reduced everything to very simple forms, solid flat planes of color. Um, and then on the right is actually a painting by Duncan Grant called The Tub. Um, both of these are now at the Tate Museum in London. Um, interestingly, um, The Tub by Grant, he once said way later in, in the 70s, he was on a radio show and said this was one of his favorites and it was the work he would, cho he would choose to be remembered by out of all of his work. Um, and this was actually inspired by Vanessa Bell bathing. To see some of their other um, more abstract things. Here on the left, we have one of the early, completely non-representational works that Vanessa Bell did called Abstract Composition. Um, she was one of the earliest to take subject matter, matter out of her work completely. She didn't do this for a long stretch of time, um, but she was trying this out. This was in about 1914. She also had another abstract work that was purchased by MoMA around that time. When you consider that the earliest non-objective paintings at all were done in 1910. Um, this is pretty soon after that. On the right, um, one of Grant's works, In Memoriam Rupert Brooke, it's from 1915, where he also is going you know, away from recognizable subject, subject matter. And in fact, you can't really see in this photo, but this started to include collage elements, which was something that they played around with a lot at this point of the decade. Uh, this was in memory of poet R Rupert Brooke, who was a friend of Grant's from school, and he was part of the, the Bloomsbury group as well. He was killed in World War I in Greece. Um, really quickly, I want to show you one other completely abstract work by Grant that is, is kind of fascinating. This is called his Abstract Kinetic Painting with Sound from 1914, and he apparently was working on this in the really early months of World War I, and it was not ever completed as he um, envisioned it. But this is collage, not only, uh, and he painted all of the pieces, the paper that created the collage. Um, it's about, let me see if I can find the dimensions. It's 14 feet long. Um, the image at the top is a little blurry, I'm sorry, but it's 14 feet long, a foot wide. It had 17 sections of collaged abstract shapes. Um, it was supposed to scroll through a box with a little opening so you would just see one section at a time and it would be accompanied by music. 
Grant shows a section, a movement from, Bra from Bach's Brandenburg Concertos that he thought would go along with it. And like I said, because of the war and some, you know, uh, things that got him sidelined with that, he was never able to actually put that all together at the time. This was um, purchased by the Tate in the early 70s, and he gave them permission to put it together then. And I believe they, they made a recording of it, but it's very fragile, so it's not actually on display or um, moving now, but pretty innovative for that time to be experimenting with something so abstract and also including motion and music all combined. Um, so those are just a few of their examples of their, you know, a little more abstract, radical things that they were experimenting with, but some of their most playful uses of abstraction actually came in the field of design, which was a collaborative project that they, um, the three main Bloomsbury artists did together starting in 1913, um, the Omega Workshops. So although they spent a lot of time doing paintings, drawings, things that we automatically think of, um, they decided to branch out and bring modern art into the home. They felt like art belonged everywhere. It should be, you know, the line between their art and everyday life should be blurred a little bit. So they started the Omega Workshops in 1913. Fry, Bell, and Grant were the co-directors. And Roger Fry said, at, as the workshop was opening to the public, it is time that the spirit of fun was introduced into furniture and fabrics. We have suffered too long from the dull and the stupidly serious. So you see Fry on the left working in the workshops with a couple of the artists. Um, on the right, I had to include one of the pieces of ceramics because it is coffee with the collection, right? So maybe they could drink drink some coffee with us in one of these cups and saucers. Um, all of the work at Omega was sold anonymously with only the Greek symbol for the letter, letter Omega as a signature. The artists the collect that worked in the collective um, worked three and a half days a week at the workshop for a stipend of 30 shillings and then the rest of their time could be devoted to their own art. Uh, the workshops did everything from dinnerware like this cup um, to fabrics used for furniture, wallpaper, and clothing. And here's a few examples of some of their fabric patterns. Usually, um, I think they had up to six that were in um, stock that you could order for things, and they came in different color combinations, but with the same, the same pattern. So they did these fabrics, they painted furniture, um, and created furniture designs. This is actually a table that Grant and Bell designed for Virginia Woolf for one of her homes, and you might be able to spot her initials there on the back of the chair. Um, they also even, um, they would do screens, um, trays, pieces of furniture, wardrobes, um, mosaics. They did dollhouses, a piano lid, lamps, um, even entire rooms. And this was actually a model nursery that they designed um, with toy animals you can see along the shelf. Those were designed by Duncan Grant. And then Vanessa Bell was responsible for the kind of Matisse-like large um, murals on the wall that go up into the ceiling. You might notice uh, that goes even there. Vanessa Bell specifically wanted the design to continue onto the ceiling because if it's a nursery, the baby is going to spend a lot of time looking up instead of looking around. So I thought that was interesting. Um, Omega lasted just until after the end of World War I, until um, 1919, thanks in large part to a person shown in one of the portraits in our collection. So we're going to talk a little bit about her. Um, this painting in our museum's collection is a portrait by Duncan Grant of an artist named Winifred Gill. And this portrait was actually painted in 1912, so the year before the Omega workshop began. Um, Gill was first employed by Roger Fry's family to help with childcare, then she became a general assistant. Later on, she managed the workshops um, starting after 1914 when the men were called off to work on the war effort. Um, she herself made prints, clothing, toys, puppets, and jewelry for the workshops. Um, here's an example of a silk tie that she designed in 1915. And you can see her in the photo on the right, she is on the right, modeling some of the dresses that Omega created 
um, she coordinated with the companies that actually fabricated the garments, furniture, pottery for the workshops, because a lot of times they came up with the designs and then they might not actually be the ones to fabricate that themselves. Uh, Gill was also a painter in her own right. And here's an example of one of her paintings from 1914, um, not, after, not long after the workshop started. Um, as far as the portrait of her that we have by Duncan Grant, uh, this is kind of interesting in terms of just their way of working together. Uh, Grant, Bell, and Fry often painted together at the same time, sharing subjects, lots of family and friends, uh, things that would have been just everyday scenes to them, people they came in contact with a lot. They were focusing really more on color and pattern and experimenting with the style. So as you can see here, there's not a lot of detail given to Winifred Gill's face in the portrait. And we'll see some other examples like that in just a minute. Um, like Picasso and some of the other um, artists working at this time, they did tend to bounce back and forth a lot in style. So we've seen some of their really more abstract work, but they did continue to paint figurative things, representational things, um, even though they were really prioritizing what the composition looked like rather than the actual subject matter to some extent. Uh, they're playing with composition, the expressive colors and brushstrokes. Um, here in this painting, if you come see it in person, you'll be able to tell that you can still see some of the unfinished canvas um, between those long expressive brushstrokes. This was painted in 1912 at Durban's, which was Roger, High, Roger Fry's home, uh, a little bit outside of London. And he had designed this house himself around 1909. You can see um, Fry here in the photo. And on the right is a photo of the, the house including the rectangular pond that is featured in our, our painting of Winifred Gill. Um, I mentioned that they often paint the same subject. So here's our, our painting again, compared with Roger Fry's portrait of Winifred Gill painted probably at the exact same time, same day. And you can see just a little bit different style, a little more solid color, a little more definition in her face. Um, and just a slightly different angle of take on the background than we get from Duncan Grant. Originally, this is a little interesting tidbit, um, originally when the, the painting came to the museum, it was under a different title, which was Pamela, Roger, Roger Fry's daughter's name. Um, well, she would have been a little bit younger when this was painted, so it didn't match up, and then this other painting existed so that they could tell that it was Winifred Gill rather than Pamela. Um, Winifred Gill's family apparently remembered her telling a story about sitting for the Bloomsbury Group um, artists on the same day that Pamela did, but she spent a lot more time sitting because Pamela got bored and wandered off. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about how long would it take them to paint this. Uh, that story aside, Grant did actually paint Pamela at another time in the previous year. And this is that, that work showing again, that same lily pond at the home. Um, this was actually finished in time to be included in that 1912 exhibition that I mentioned earlier. And it was apparently one of the most popular works in the British section. Um, he also borrowed the same subject for a table design that he did for the Omega workshops a little bit later, and also did some screens and other pieces inspired by that same setting. I um, want to go ahead and show you the other portrait that we have by Grant in our collection, and this one is of his fellow artist, Vanessa Bell. Um, as I've mentioned, she was one of the other major uh, visual artists in the group. Um, he Grant and Bell, along with Roger Fry, spent a lot of time working together. Um, but Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant had a, a very special relationship as well. This is a fairly early portrait of her. Um, she went on to become his fellow artist, collaborator, a friend, later a lover, and a companion for most of his life. Um, he painted her painted her portrait dozens of times in a range of styles. So to go along with our coffee, if you got that, it, this is one of many of the portraits. Um, the very first portrait he did of her was in 1911, and he painted her for 50 years. The last work he did of her was a sketch 
on her deathbed in 1961. So there's a lot, a lot of images of, of Belle done by Grant. This one is from 1912. Um, just so you can see them together. This is a photo of Belle and Grant um, around the time actually that the painting would have been done. Uh, Grant, Bell, Grant and Belle gravitated to each other early in um, their acquaintance and they were painting and working together with Fry, with Omega and, and other projects. But around 1913, they kind of paired off by themselves a little bit more working just the two of them. Um, after the beginning of World War I, um, they actually lived together and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, our painting was probably done, since it was done in 1912, it was probably actually painted at one of Virginia Woolf's country homes that she rented. And just for comparison, this is a, a much older photo of Vanessa Bell reading that seems to match a little bit to give you an idea how that might look in real life. Um, around this time, they were painting a lot of portraits, a lot of scenes of their friends using this kind of blanked out face style, this kind of anonymous um, faces in the portraits. So here's a couple of other examples. Um, they're more interested in the composition, kind of taking things as they come. The one on the left is showing actually Virginia Woolf and um, their brother Adrian and Leonard Wolf on the roof of a home that some of those people shared in London in 1911, 1912. So this was actually before Virginia Woolf was married. This was painted just around the time that she got engaged to Woolf. Um, on the right, you see conversation piece by Vanessa Bell. And um, this is her brother and Leonard Woolf, some of the same characters from the left. And then her husband Clive's feet show up in the blue socks but you can also get a little glimpse of him in the mirror over the mantelpiece. So they're playing around with some cropped um, figures. They're not necessarily rearranging things to show them in a more ideal way. Uh, Bell called Grant's style around this time his leopard style, where he was using those kind of long or um, pointillist type brush strokes. She liked to think of some of her works as almost painted mosaics or stained glass where she would use really dark outlines and then flat areas of, col of, of bold color. Um, another portrait done around this time that Vanessa Bell did with that same kind of um, indistinct features in the face was of her sister, Virginia Woolf. So um, this is her portrait of Virginia from around 1912 as well. Um, while to us, this may not be a, a perfect portrait when you don't see any of those facial features. Leonard Wolf later said of a similar portrait that it was one of the things most like Virginia that he'd ever seen. It really captured her, her spirit, he believed. Um, another kind of funny thing, maybe playing into this, Duncan Grant apparently noted at one point that Virginia was notorious for not liking to sit for portraits and you had to work very quickly or she might just get up and walk out. So um, that might come into play a little bit as well. Uh, one thing I did want to note, Vanessa Bell also designed the covers and illustrations for a lot of her sister's books and other books published by Virginia and Leonard's Hogarth Press. So you can see a couple of those dust jackets here on this slide as well. So um, just wanted to show you a few more of Grant's portraits of Belle. Since as I mentioned, he painted her very frequently in different styles at different stages of their life. Um, on the left, interestingly, there's a, a, a full length portrait of her that you can't really see in this, this slide, but he incorporated some collage elements even to his, into his portraits. So this had some of the actual fabric from the dress later incorporated into the painting. Um, on the right, you'll see a, a portrait of Vanessa at Charleston, which was Grant and Bell's home for many years out in the um, Sussex countryside. They actually moved there early. They moved to Charleston in 1916, but they had moved together out of London in the early years of the war. Um, Duncan Grant was gay and he was in a number of different relationships over the course of his life. Um, and when he and his then partner um, registered as conscientious, conscientious objectors during World War I, they were required to do 
national service as farm laborers. And so they were needing to move out of London and find some work. And Vanessa Bell took care of all the details. She found a home for them and moved her kids. And Duncan and his partner moved as well. And they took their artwork and moved out into the country. They had another house that they rented for a little bit, but in 1916, they found Charleston Farmhouse. And you'll see that in the portrait on the right. And that's where they lived for many years um, during the war. Then they would go back and forth from London and then move there permanently a little bit later. Um, they continued painting while they were there. Uh, there was also a brief romantic relationship between Grant and Bell during this time. And you'll see here a painting that he did of Vanessa while she was pregnant with their daughter. Um, very bold colors here, might remind you a little bit of Matisse. Um, interesting to think about, this was at the time a very rare thing to have a secular painting of a pregnant woman. So it was kind of unusual, an unusual subject matter at the time. Um, on the right, you'll see Vanessa with their daughter Angelica in the garden at their, their home. Um, Angelica actually, in a nod to convention from a, a family that was very unconventional and liked to just throw uh, traditional expectations aside, um, they did raise Angelica as Clive's daughter, Vanessa's husband, took her in, gave her her name, and she actually wasn't told until she was almost an adult that Duncan Grant was her biological father. Uh, she has an entire memoir about this um, called Deceived with Kindness. If you want to read some of the details, I'm leaving out a whole lot of juicy details. Um, so that's a very interesting read to hear a little bit more about their, their unconventional arrangement. Um, even though not long after Angelica was born, Vanessa and Duncan's romantic relationship ended, they continued to live together until her death in 1961. So it was a very long-term close partnership um, that continued with their families coming and going and all of their different relationships kind of under one roof. Um, here's one other uh, portrait I wanted to show you of Vanessa Bell that Duncan Grant did. The following year, uh, this is a view from inside Charleston Farmhouse out into their garden, not unlike the, the, the picture we have of her in our collection, sitting in a chair, possibly reading. And the title of this, The Room with a View, was a nod to E.M. Forster and his novel, A Room with a View, from a little bit before that. Uh, Forster had actually recently visited Charleston Farm, Farmhouse, and so Grant gave it the title in his honor. Uh, so following the war, um, like I mentioned, their romantic relationship ended after Angelica was born, but they stayed together the rest of their lives. Um, the Omega workshops ended in 1919 also, follow in the year following the end of the war, but they continued interior design independently for their own home and for their friends for the next few decades. Um, as far as painting, most of the artists' styles reverted to more representational, impressionistic works after the war. After the war, they didn't really stick with those very um, radical abstract styles that they had they played around with. But they continued doing portraits, still lifes, murals, um, design work. They did murals for a church near where they lived. Um, Grant was actually commissioned to do paintings and murals and furnishings for uh, a cruise ship at one point. They really dabbled in a lot of things, did theater sets. Um, perhaps though one of their greatest works of art was their home, Charleston. So this is Charleston Farmhouse where um, Grant and Bell lived, as I mentioned, from 1916 on. Um, when they first moved there, it didn't have electricity or running water. Um, the garden was mostly vegetables and fruit during the war because it was things that they actually needed. Uh, but over the years, they were able to, to change the garden into a real artist's garden with sculpture and flowers. And it was something that appeared a lot in their works. Um, we'll show you a couple photos inside. They painted pretty much every surface that they could from doors to fireplaces, bookshelves, the furniture. Um, a lot of Omega things are included here. Um, by, I believe it was right before World War II, they moved back here permanently rather than just being there off and on from London. And Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, their kids, and Clive Bell were all 
residents here um, pretty much full time. Um, Vanessa Bell died in 1961, as I mentioned, and Grant was devastated. It was one of the few times that he did not work for a stretch of months where he normally would paint every day. Um, even after she was gone, he felt like he still knew what her opinion of things would be, and it was said that he deferred to her judgment. When people came to visit, he would point out her works rather than his um, for praise and to discuss them. So she was really an important um, part of his life even after she was gone. Um, Grant continued working and living at Charleston until he died in 1978. And then he was buried next to Vanessa in the churchyard of the nearby village. Charleston was actually restored and open to the public in 1986. So you can go and visit and see a lot of their works in person. Um, I was telling someone the other day, it's kind of interesting to think about that they did all of this when technically they were renting this home all of those decades. So when we're even afraid to put a nail in an apartment wall, it's kind of funny to think about what they did to their rental home. But it's a beautiful place to visit. And um, here's one last view. This is actually Grant's studio. Um, and you can see some of his assortment of artworks of his own and of other people, um, some of the furnishings, the murals, decorations. And I'll just point out this little painting right here is another of his portraits of Vanessa Bell. And he's got a very early photograph of her on the mantelpiece as well. Uh, the screen that's, that's standing here is one of their screens designed in the Omega workshops back in the teens. So that stuck around for quite a while. And this photograph is actually showing Duncan in the garden at Charleston um, in the last few years of his life. Um, that brings us to the end of my talk. I am gonna show you really quick where you can see uh, the work that's currently on display if you are able to come visit the museum. Um, Winifred Gill is currently um, on display in our galleries and it's in the, the Lester wing. You'll see in a moment, looking back to the entryway uh, where you come into the museum, right there, you come down the corridor and it's just around the corner here in one of our galleries of European art um, next to a very Cezanne-like uh, still life there. And you can check out Winifred Gill in person. Currently the portrait of, portrait of Vanessa Bell is not on display, but we heard a rumor just this week that there's a chance it might come out of the vault soon. So stay tuned and you might be able to get that um, on your list as well. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Karen. That was amazing. Um, it's so fascinating to hear all of that information about not just Duncan Grant, but the Bloomsbury group, and in particular, his very you know non-traditional relationship with Vanessa Bell. I think for all of us, it really gives us a much broader, you know, deeper understanding of that painting in particular. Um, if anyone has any questions that you would like to ask to Karen, uh, please feel free to do so. Use the chat and go ahead and enter that there. Um, Karen, I do have a question for you while we give everyone a moment to gather their thoughts. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how these paintings came into the museum's collection? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it was in the, the notes there on the screen that you might have seen that both of these paintings came to us from the same collector in 2005, and they were a gift of Dr. Mark Allen Everett, who um, is originally from Oklahoma City. He got his undergrad and medical degrees from OU, so a Sooner. Um, he was a dermatologist and taught at OU's med school for decades and uh, was a great supporter of the arts in the city and at OU. Apparently his motto was, have fun doing good. And I think he did a lot of that, um, but he still has um, funding for programs here on campus and I think at other universities. Um, he apparently became interested in Bloomsbury in the early 1970s and made a pilgrimage over there uh, to visit several sites, including Charleston. And after buying the portrait of Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant actually invited them to come for tea and a visit. And they had apparently a lovely um, afternoon chat and then they continued um, corresponding until Grant's death. So he um, 
had a personal relationship with the artist, which was kind of interesting. Um, he also collected first editions of Virginia Woolf's books. Uh, a, apparently, it was before my time, but a big part of the Everett collection was shown at the Fred Jones in the late 90s. And there's a catalog of that. He had a really wide ranging um, collection and you know, interests. So he had some ancient Greek pottery that's now at the Sam Noble. Some of his books and other items, I believe, are in the collections of the Bazell Library. Um, but we're very excited that he gave a few to us. Um, we have the two portraits that we talked about today and also a couple of works on paper. Um, in total, there are four works by Grant that Dr. Everett gave to the museum. We're certainly lucky to have those. Um, so just a, an interesting note. So uh, Christopher Blackwell does make a, a really nice comment. Um, he said that was a wonderful presentation and he would like his house to look like Duncan's on the inside and out. <laughs> and no, kidding. No kidding. I, like I said, that's kind of a work of art on its own. And it's amazing to visit and be able to see all the nooks and crannies. They, they really wanted to just make art part of every, you know, their everyday life. So uh, interesting to see how they pulled that off. Uh, I did forget to mention, um, if you all want to learn a little bit more about the group or Grant in particular, um, just a couple of things that you might want to check out when you have some time. Um, they have a lot of work in the collections at the v &A Museum in London, um, the Tate and Charleston Farmhouse. They all have great websites that have um, search capabilities where you can go and just put one of their names or even Omega or Bloomsbury and things will pop up. Um, I think I mentioned in passing Angelica Garnett, which was their daughter, wrote a memoir that's very interesting. Um, for a lot of juicy details, I haven't watched it yet, but apparently um, the BBC had a mini series just a few years ago called Life in Squares that gives you the whole soap opera of not just Duncan Grant and Vanessa Bell, but some of the other characters. And um, you may be familiar with some Bloomsbury things and without even realizing it, but if you've read or watched um, Michael Cunningham's The Hours or the film based on that, that had um, Nicole Kidman and some other great um, actors, that is something to check out. Also a kind of peripheral artist that I didn't mention today was Dora Carrington. And there was a great movie about her in the early 90s with Emma Thompson and Jonathan Price, so that's a good one. And then of course, um, the writers, Ian Forster and Virginia Woolf, uh, you could go straight to the source. Howard's End is one of my favorites or A Room with a View um, to the Lighthouse, which the artist in that was inspired by Woolf's sister, Vanessa Bell. Um, and then of course, the great Merchant Ivory movies um, based on Forster, like Howard's End. So check <laughs> Thank you so much. It, it sounds like a lot of people um, from what I can see in the chat are actually interested in doing some more research. So I appreciate you sharing that with everyone. Um, did you, so how, can you tell everybody, how did you get really interested in Duncan Grant and the Bloomsbury Group? Was it from Howard's End? I think maybe you had mentioned that to me personally. <laughs> so I'm a recovering English major. So I came to them, I think, and a lot of people, especially in America, from what I've read, are more familiar with the, the writers to begin with. Um, I first read Forster when I was in high school, um, right before the movie of Howard's End came out with Emma Thompson and Helena Bonham Carter, Anthony Hopkins. It's a masterpiece, go check that out. Um, but I read the novel and also A Room with a View. And then it wasn't until college, I was in a, a seminar that one of the sections was about Forster. And just in passing, my professor mentioned, oh, there's also the visual artists and, you know, their furniture design and all of that. And I, you know, didn't know anything about that. So fast forward a few years when I was in grad school studying art history and trying to decide what to research and um, can't get away from England. I love England. And so I thought, what, Brit I don't know that much about British art. You know, I was studying mostly European art and that was kind of the the rabbit hole I went down and it was really fun to be able to learn a little bit more about them and then to actually go and see their work in museums, um, visit their home, kind of travel around, I guess kind of like Dr. Everett did and see where they were. Um, and it was actually interesting. I was working on my research 
in 2005 and was about done when these pieces came to the museum. So I had traveled all the way to London to see their work in person and then suddenly here it was um, right down the hall from the office. So it's very fun. <laughs> wow, that's pretty fortuitous. <laughs> that's great. Um, I don't see, does any, I don't see any more questions. Um, it looks like a few people are getting ready to head out. So I guess we can go ahead and wrap it up a little bit early unless Karen, you have any last little tidbits or anything you wanna share with everyone. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoyed our conversation and don't forget to mark your calendars for the next Coffee with the Collection that will take place on Friday, September 24th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, Dr. Andrew Phelan will be discussing the work of Emilio Amaro, uh, focusing on his painting, The Game. You can register for this event uh, by clicking on the link in the chat that I'm going to put in there right now. Uh, there we are. Um, and you can also find it on our website. So we hope to see you all in September for that exciting conversation and have a wonderfully creative weekend, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. -bye. You.